So today we're starting off with a slightly different topic to the things that we've covered in recent uh, webinars. This time we're looking at uh, the urgent requirement to reduce com uh, combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, and of course that's to cut down on the emission of harmful greenhouse gases. But of course the dependence on uh, these uh, fossil fuels isn't going to go away straight away and it takes a very long time to uh, transition uh, a whole energy system. Um, if we think back to the last time that happened, the transition from coal took roughly uh, about a century. And um, today our speaker is a, a very interesting guy called uh, Ian Pygram, and his background is in petrophysics. So that's the physical, uh, chemical and mechanical properties of rock, their fluids and the fluid flow. And Ian held a variety of senior roles with BP and its predecessors in this field until his retirement a year ago. Over many years, he's worked in projects for ARCO and later BP in Europe, North Africa, Middle East, Asia. Uh, and his last role was supporting a carbon capture and storage project. So very much forward thinking, but with uh, a massive wealth of experience behind him. And Ian continues his interest in geology and related subjects. And he says, um, a holiday without a camera, ge uh, geological maps, information uh, wouldn't be the same, especially as one of his sons is now a geologist. So who better to tell us about the journey we're all on from hydrocarbon to low carbon petroleum by discovering what's in a borehole, the, um, the title of today's presentation. So uh, my name's Nigel Ward and I'm going to be guiding you through today's uh, proceedings. We're going to hear in a moment from Ian and he's going to give us a very interesting presentation. And following that, we'll have a, a, a round table discussion and put some of your questions forward. Um, so that's all from me for now, and uh, I'll be back later after Ian has uh, guided us through his presentation. Okay, so I think the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nigel. I appreciate it. Well, um, thank you for showing interest in my talk. Um, I hope I at least educate you a little bit and show you the sorts of things I've been doing as a career and enjoyed myself immensely trying to tackle all the different problems that you have in the subsurface and um, what I'll do is go through a few things like making sure things click there we go um, I'll talk a bit about borehole construction I'll talk about what a hydrocarbon reservoir is because those are useful in the future and um, if you know what the hydrocarbon reservoir is like you can better use it in the future I'll talk about drilling I'll talk about how we investigate some of the rocks and then I'll talk about how we put everything together to get a better description of the subsurface. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the other uses of the technology that uh, we use in oil and gas drilling. And then just a few slides of future thoughts. They're not very erudite, but they might stimulate some sort of discussion. And uh, hopefully we'll have a nice uh, chat afterwards. So let's get going, shall we? So borehole construction. You have a big bit to start off and to make sure that you get the bit clear you usually circulate drilling mud down through the drill pipe and then back up the annulus outside the drill pipe and you collect that at the surface for special kit and I'll show you that later on. So that the borehole doesn't fall apart you run a big pipe called liner or casing into the ground and you then cement it so if I can uh, get the pointer, hopefully you can see the pointer there. So on the second diagram from the left, there's a pipe in the ground after it's been drilled. You hope it doesn't collapse while you, before you get there. Then you cement it. So the orange material, the color around that pipe is cement. And that's really important. So the next slide is a bit more complicated. It shows you a second string of pipe in there and then a third hole section where they're drilling and to drill a borehole to a great depth you start with a very wide borehole you run pipe you cement it you drill another borehole inside the one you've just made you run pipe you cement it and then you drill another borehole and as you get deeper and deeper the borehole gets narrower one of the important things is the cementing it's vital that it gets 
cemented properly so that the cement helps to protect the casing and also isolates all the individual layers of rock above and below. So I've put a red bar in that uh, one on there and say that's got gas in it. Then I put a blue bar and let's say that's a formation with water in it. And the idea of the cement is to stop the gas getting up into the water. And in America, they have lots of places where they do, did drilling in the very early parts of the century or last century, and the casing wasn't well cemented and you get basically gas in your tap water. It's nothing to do with fracking or anything like that. It's basically poor well design and execution. Occasionally it might be fracking, but most of it is actually due to poor well design. And then on the right hand diagram, it just shows you how the same thing happens in water wells, in wells rather, which are in water. So you just have to have a riser, which is a continuation of the casing up to the drilling rig and everything else works pretty much the same. Although I've got some red diagrams there, which are illustrate where the blowout preventer might go and I'll show you a picture one of those later on but the blowout preventer might be a little bit different offshore than it might be on a land well. Sometimes the uh, casing is run at a great depth and if you get too far down you don't really want to run pipe all the way to surface so you run what's called a liner and you hang the liner off on the inside of the bottom of the previous one that saves an awful lot of metal and also helps you to have narrower to tolerances sometime. So hydrocarbon reservoirs, what are they like? And we might be able to use those in the future for other, other purposes. So I'm just gonna go through what they might look like, talk about the environment a bit because it's quite important, and then look at the essential ingredients for a reservoir to make it work. So these are two examples of reservoirs on the left, You've got the millstone grit. If you frequent the Derbyshire Dales, the Peak District, that kind of area, or do any climbing, you'll be very familiar with the millstone grit. And on the right hand side, there are pictures of the Bridport Sands, and they constitute the reservoir that was first drilled for the Witch Farm oil field in the Pool Bay area. And the Carboniferous Limestone on the left was actually drilled in 1939. And 1939 and provides some really useful oil during the Second World War from a location in Nottinghamshire at uh, Ekring and Duke's Wood. And that little picture on the top, life, top, top left is a thin section of rock. So if you cut a very thin section of rock and then grind it down very carefully to a thickness of 30 microns, you can shine light through it. And that picture there shows you some grains which have been cut by that cutting process that's one millimetre scale bar, so these grains are up to about a millimetre in size and it shows you lots of very small little bits and bigger bits all mixed together. So I might infer from that that the ability to flow fluid through that rock might not be as good as if you had a well characterised rock with pieces of um, sandstone grains that were all the same size. If you had them all the same size, the fluid will flow through better. That one on the top left doesn't flow through as well as it might, but you can still get oil out of it. And that's what they did in Duke's Wood during the Second World War. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about temperatures and pressures. So on this diagram here, we've got depth going downwards in meters and it's true vertical depth. So you can integrate the depth with the density of the material and can work out what the, uh, the pressures might be on the top scale you've got the the pressure in megapascals it doesn't really matter what the units are but the blue line is the pressure that water would take if it was all the way from surface down to those particular depths without any interruption and of course geology being what it is you do get examples where there is an interruption and you don't get a nice smooth pressure gradient but normal hydrostatic gradient will look like that and then if you integrate the weight of all the rock above you, you get that magenta curve, which is the stress that you would get if you had all that rock on top of you. The effective stress that the rock feels is the difference between the, the vertical stress of the rock and the pore pressure. So if you have a very high pressure fluid in there, it's a bit like a tyre. If you put a very high level of uh, air pressure in your car tyre, you can't push it in very much. So if you had a high 
degree of water pressure in your rock, you wouldn't be able to squash it very much. And I'll show you an example in a minute where some of these pressures can change. So the effective stress changes dramatically upwards. The other thing you need to think about is temperature. Temperature influences the ability to run tools in the hole, and it also influences the properties of the rocks and the fluids. So different rocks have got different thermal conductivity. And if you look in the bottom part of that curve, there's a word that says anhydritic halite. That's where this my pointer is right now. And that's got quite high thermal conductivity. I've got a second version of this slide in a minute, which shows you the order of uh, thermal conductivity for different rocks if you're really interested, but I'll stick to this one because it was simpler for you to see. And if you've got something like a mudstone, which is more like an insulating blanket, then the temperature gradient is a bit shallower. And these change as you go down and influence the temperatures that, that you're working at and the particular tools experience. One thing you do have to do is make sure that when you're drilling, the pressure of the fluids in the rock do not blow all the mud out of the borehole. You'll have a blowout then or a kick, which is just a slight influx. So the mud pressure must be a bit above the water pressure or hydrocarbon pressure and below the rock strength or pressure. Now, I'm going to the next slide because stresses come into here. There are three principal stresses, a minimum, an intermediate and a maximum one. One of those will be the vertical stress and the other one, or the other two will be the two horizontal stresses. And what you don't want to do is have your mud pressure greatest, greater than the minimum horizontal stress, if that's what it is, or any of the horizontal stresses. And fracture the rock because that's what a fracturing system or a fracking system would do. So you've got your three principal stresses. I've also put some unit conversions up there for those that like numbers. You can ignore them if you like, but the three principal stresses will be one of the vertical stress and the two horizontal stresses and the, the order in which they come will depend on the angle of fracture that might occur. So you really do need to understand the stress state to properly drill a well and if you want to stimulate it the fracking get the fracking right. So what you do is you go to the world stress map typically which is this one and this is just a map of the maximum horizontal stress at different depths but I've just averaged it out and the yellow arrows on here are a rough orientation of the maximum horizontal stress. Mostly in North Africa to Europe it's roughly north, northwest, south, southeast but there's all sorts of goings on around across the Apennines, down through Turkey and Greece. And if you can imagine squeezing a pip between your fingers, that's what's happening to Turkey and Greece. So Turkey and Greece are being spat towards one side because North Africa and Arabia are crashing into Eurasia very slowly, of course. And those movements are influencing the stresses in the rock. And those stresses are really important to get your fracturing or whatever, or even the well design properly executed. The components of a reservoir, to have hydrocarbon in a reservoir, you need a source of hydrocarbon, migration of that hydrocarbon into a rock that can be a reservoir, and then you've got to seal it in that structure. So to get those four ingredients is a rather rare, but you can do it if you know how to look for it. So in the bottom diagram here, um, you've got vertical migration of hydrocarbon. Way below this depth in this diagram, there is a, an interval which just generates lots of hydrocarbon. It's full of lots of dead bugs. There's a nice sandy layer that covers the whole area, which is potentially a good reservoir, but because it was deposited so rapidly, water hasn't oozed out of the rock quickly enough for the pressure to equilibrate to a nice hydrostatic gradient. So what you have here is an effective stress, which is not very much. So these rocks are really quite squidgy. And when you drill them, it's a real pain because they squidge into the borehole. Later on, a million years later, there's been a bit of deformation, some mountain building, and this widespread sandstone has been exposed at the surface. Any excess pressure is then bled off and you can get a nice uniform 
hydrostatic pressure gradient with water from atmospheric pressure down to the depth. And what that does is cause an increase in the effective stress of that particular rock. With that effective stress increase, the mudstones adjacent to the sandstone then squash a bit more because those pressures propagate a little way into the mudstone and you therefore have a seal above that sandstone. So what you've now got, because that sandstone was exposed on the surface some way out to the west, you have a viable reservoir with gas trapped in there. You get still migration from below. And because these rocks are being squashed so much with recent sedimentation, and there's still water coming out of the basin and that causes a flow up to the surface so the gas in this particular example is tilted because of that flow underneath it. I'll quickly talk about drilling. First of all you need to know where to drill so you get the shape of things from seismic but drilling in a direction is not always easy and I'll talk a bit about things that can influence it and some steering. So seismic, this is, a, this is a field that uh, I worked on, or well, didn't work on this field, but I worked on something nearby. And typically seismic is sailed up and down. You have a boat with a big streamer behind it with microphones or hydrophones actually, but they're effectively microphones. And you make a bang with various materials, either air guns or dynamite or whatever. On shore, it's typically dynamite. Offshore, it's often air guns and you listen for the echoes. And a picture's built up from those echoes. It's very much like uh, an ultrasound scan on somebody's stomach, for example, and you get an, an idea of shape. To get it into 3D, you have to have rows up and down and across. So you have a grid of seismic data and the geophysicist will spend hours and hours at a computer picking the surfaces that you can see in different colors on here and we'll build a map for each surface and what you end up is getting a bump hopefully and that would be a trap for a reservoir and you'd then work out where you would drill it from a particular location where you can put a drill rig and what you don't want to do necessarily is to drill into a fault or anything like that or drill through shallow gas. Seismic can help you identify those and safely get you to the place where you, you can drill. Sometimes drilling can be entertaining to say the least. I've been on wells where the drill bit's gone in directions that you don't really wish. Um, so here's just a random picture. I took this picture late one winter evening down at uh, Miller Cave and it's a picture of the Crackington formation just south of Bude, sort of northeast of Tintagel and you can see this rock is really bent up it's got lovely chevron folds but you can imagine a drill bit trying to get through here as the drill bit reaches some of these angular rocks it's going to be deflected and if those rocks vary a lot you can imagine the drill bit struggling to get to the place you really want so understanding the rocks and how they might influence the drill bit is quite important. You can design BHAs to cope with some of these sorts of issues or you can have steerable drilling machines and I'll show you some of those schematically in a minute. One of the really important things in drilling is that the drill string is in tension. The derrick on the rig is just a crane. It holds the weight of the drill string and that drill string is in tension. It all gets buckled up if you, you get it wrong. And at the bottom of the drill string, you have much thicker pipe called drill collars or heavyweight drill pipe phasing up into an ordinary drill pipe. And those drill collars can accommodate all sorts of bit of cunning machinery to work out where you are and what you're going through. And I'll show you some pictures in a moment. The important thing is, the drill string is in tension and if you want to go horizontally you have to have all that heavyweight drill pipe above the bit where you want to go horizontally so that the drill pipe is pushed in the direction that you desire. So steering the hole you can have all sorts of directions of drilling. I've drilled holes in horizontal, I've drilled holes uphill, um, angular holes and straight down holes which sometimes struggle to go straight down. So that diagram on the left is just a schematic of what you might uh, 
do you in the early days we used to use steerable motors which had a a bent housing at the bottom so the bit was at a slight angle usually less than three degrees i've exaggerated it a little bit here and all you have is a motor in one of those collars and the mud actually drives that motor and turns the bit and if you're wishing to steer in a particular direction you orientate the bit to go in that orientation you pump mud through the motor and the bit will whir around and hopefully you'll go off in that direction. If you want to drill straight, you just turn the whole string from the derrick. So you'll have a, an ROP of the whole drill string as well as the rate of, rate of penetration from the whole drill string, but you'll have a, an RPM of the whole drill string as well as the motor on the bottom. What you can also do is to have one of the rotary steerable systems, which are somewhat more expensive than the simple steerable motor. They allow one to have the whole drill string rotating and the bit changes direction at the rate of rotation of the string. Still usually powered by the drilling mud, but cunningly designed so that the pressure of the drilling mud activates various bits and pieces of the equipment to point the bit in the right direction. So with the point the bit rotary steerable system, you basically vary the angle of the bit subtly by having, I've just drawn a th schematic bar up from the bit. And what you do is tilt that bar so the bit goes in one direction or another. And you just turn the whole lot around and that bar is held at a particular orientation so you have a nice smooth borehole. The push the bit rotary steerable system has got usually either little buttons, pistons or something like that, or pads that nudge the bit in a particular direction. And as the bit rotates, or as the drill collar rotates, those little pistons say, push it in the right direction. So they're always going in and out. In and, out. and if you imagine this thing rotating at several, several RPM, these little things whiz in and out at quite a rate. And I've just schematically coloured them there, sort of uh, yellow, magenta and blue. And you can imagine as it rotates round, each of those different paddles in time is pushing the bit in the right direction. Inside these drill collars, you'll have various compasses and inclinometers and what have you, and a mechanism for communicating back to the surface. Usually the, the, you interrupt the mud flow or put a pressure into the mud flow that you can detect at surface and you basically send what's like Morse code up inside the mud and that allows one to get measurements from the bit up to the surface. Here's an example of a horizontal well. We initially had a seismic idea of the shape of that structure and that's the dashed green line. We then drilled the hole and discovered that the penetration point on the left was a bit higher than desired or expected rather. And then we drilled the horizontal well, deliberately going up a few times and we tagged the top and realized that the structure was a lot flatter than the seismic initially thought or it allowed us to believe. You'd also notice the massive vertical exaggeration on this. The distances on the bottom are 2,000 to 4,500 feet and the vertical scale is naught to 100 feet. So this is very much exaggerated vertically. So these are very, very gentle horizontal wells, but they just look very wiggly at this very high exaggeration. I'll then talk about now some of the investigation techniques. The investigation techniques that we use are twofold. One of them is getting pieces of rock, and they include core where you get a solid tube of rock and or a cylinder of rock and then the other bits are the cuttings from the drill bit so you imagine when you drill a piece of wood you get lots of shavings of wood coming up and it's very much the same with drilling rock you get bits of rock coming up and those rocks rock pieces are brought up in the mud so the mud is made quite viscous so that it can hold the cuttings and the mud brings the cuttings to surface and then they're sieved out and we look at them I'll talk about some of the drilling related measurements to help us drill the well, how those are recorded on a log so you can compare some of those 
responses to help us understand lithology. Talk about core a bit. And I'll talk about some of the other downhole measurements that we acquire from our measuring tools. And I'll talk a bit about acquiring those data. So when you have a borehole, you drill a hole in the rock, you've got mud in the borehole, and in that left-hand diagram, the mud's gray. But that mud, if you've got a permeable rock, oozes into the formation. So if you've got a sandstone or a limestone with poor space, that mud oozes into, into the rock. So therefore, the measurements you make are influenced by the presence of that mud. What you do do is add solids to the mud so that you build up a mud cake on the side of the borehole wall to try and reduce that loss of mud into the formation. So as the mud oozes past, the formation acts a bit like a sieve and the mud solids uh, accumulate on the wall of the borehole and that helps to reduce the amount of mud loss into the formation. To get a core, and those central two pictures at the top, those are of a core head or a core bit, and that cylinder of rock will go up the middle part, so you cut rock around the outside of that cylinder of rock, and then it's got some cunning, bit like wedges in the bottom there, as you pick up off bottom, you snap the cylinder of rock and can bring it to surface. Sometimes you have a tool that you can lower into the hole on wireline. That's a sidewall coring tool and very much the same. There's your little coring tool there. It's much smaller. That's on somebody's hand. You can see it's the width of a finger and a half. So a tiny little coring head there, which you push against the borehole wall against that backup arm there. And you can drill little pieces of rock out of the borehole wall, extract them and put them into the tool. The drilling itself uses drill pipe and they're racked back in the derrick in what are called stands. So that's three bits of drill pipe screwed together to speed up the, the drilling of the hole. The pipe are left on the pipe rack down at the bottom here. They're pulled up on the pipe ramp there through the V-door and novice people are often sent to find the keys to the V-door. Um, unfortunately, there's no key to the V-door, it's just that gap there. And the blowout preventer sits underneath there. And then there are other bits, that's the, the returns flow line there. And any gas in there will be circulated through here to get rid of any gas in the mud so that you can feed it back into the borehole. Some of those drilling related measurements can be quite important. So here we have acoustic mud pit level monitoring. So you can imagine a huge, great big tank with drilling mud in here on the left. And you've got these echo devices that measure the top of the mud in there. If you were to have a kick, in other words, an influx of fluid from a formation into the borehole, you might have an increase in the mud volume. And these sensors in the mud pits will pick up that increase and you could very quickly try and sort the problem out. You can see the diagram in the middle here, the mud pit uh, walkway, where you can walk over one pit to the next and just keep an eye on what's going on. The pumps here are the mud pumps. So these are huge, great big pumps with big pistons that get the mud moving to pump it right the way down. Imagine you've got a four or five kilometer well, it takes some effort to push the mud down the drill string and up to the surface again. So you have some pretty big pumps and you can work out how much mud is going into the hole at what rate by the stroke rate on each of the pumps. You add those together and you can basically work out how many cubic meters of mud are going into the borehole at any particular time. And if you know the size of the borehole, you can work out where a particular piece of mud will be at a particular time so that when the cuttings come back to the surface, you can assign a depth to them. The returns flow line also has measuring sensors on them. And here's an example enlarged here, and they will measure the mud properties. So they might be mud resistivity, density, viscosity, and some of those other measurements that are useful to understand how the mud's flowing through the, the borehole. And while you're drilling, you're taking your cuttings out and examining those. But what I'll show you here is a picture of the blowout preventer. So the blowout preventer's 
a series of valves. It's actually a stack because you've got more than one valve. You've got valves that will close around the pipe but keep it in good condition. So they've got a pipe shape gap in there. And the first thing you'll do if you have a problem is move the drill pipe so the connections aren't down through the blowout preventer. You'll just have the, the bare drill pipe through the blowout preventer so that if you really have to do the ultimate and cut the drill pipe, you have that. So you've got blind rams, which are just dead end pieces to shut things off. You have shear rams, which cut the pipe and various other ones. And at the very top, you usually have a, an annular preventer, which is basically like a big, big rubber donut. And that allows you to pull drill pipe out, but still keeping the pressure on there. At the very top of the blow, blowout preventer, the BOP, is the return flow line here. And that return flow line basically comes out. I've got a picture up there of another one. So that, that funnel shaped thing there catches all the drill mud that spills on the drill floor above. And it flows back into the flow line down through what are called the shakers, which are basically big sieves to capture the cuttings so that they may be looked at. And then the mud goes through to the, the mud, mud pits. Gas is also extracted from that flow line so you can work out the amount of gas that has come from the rocks. And the rest of the cuttings are analyzed. Sometimes you have lots of other sensors if you have a reasonable need for it. So the geochemistry, they have x-ray fluorescence, x-ray diffraction, infrared spectroscopy, natural gamma ray spectrometry, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, just, just using the very similar way to the uh, NMR body images, you work out the, the pore structure of rocks using NMR. And all of those can be done on the rig if you so desire, but most of it's basically a microscope, cuttings tray and you look at the character of the rock, the grain size, how well sorted it is. Remember I talked about the millstone grit saying it was not very well sorted. You've got big grains and little ones. If it's very well sorted, that diagram on the top right, they're all about the same size. So you look at all those different characteristics of the grains and get a feel for what the, the rock might be. Here's an example of a mud log. You don't need to look at everything in detail, but what you do have on the left hand track, you have some of the drilling parameters. They have weight on bit, rotations per minute of the drill string, the mud flow rate in usually gallons US per minute, the standpipe pressure. So the standpipe's the pipe that takes the mud up to the top of the drill string and then goes by pipe into the top of the drill string. And the pressure is quite important there. And then the torque, the drill string torque, is uh, also recorded on the mud log. This will be surface torque in this particular example. You can also have torque from sensors down hole as well. And you'll have graphically the, the rate of penetration, the ROP, so see where you're going faster or slower. Some rocks are typically faster to drill than others. You'll have a description of the pathologies down here from the mud loggers. And if you've got the borehole falling apart and caving in on you, you'll see some cavings which you can differentiate and get that information back to the drillers to say that the borehole is not behaving particularly well and they might need to increase the mud weight or something. Or you're seeing lots of steel. I can remember reporting back to the drilling engineer because I could lift some of the cuttings bags up with a magnet. There was so much steel from casing in them. And you report back and say, look, you're wearing steel out somewhere. Something's not quite right. The next track along is uh, the amount of gas at particular depths and you might have a flame ionization detector and that sort of total cuttings gas or you might have quite a sophisticated chromatograph and this log has got both on those and these devices have a long coil typically which separates the different components of the gas and you can then work out how much individual gases are in the in the system. You can get a good idea of whether you're drilling a gas or an oil well from those. Then the descriptions on the right are all from the mud loggers looking down the microscope and describing those cuttings. When you get the core, typically in the old days the uh, core was caught. Uh, so what you do is take the core head off and then have a break. So this metal gadget here, there's a big bar pointing sideways, 
the last thing you want to do is get your fingers underneath there. Lots of geologists used to lose fingers by putting them underneath here. You've got a very high weight of rock still up inside that core barrel. Um, so what they do is whack it with a hammer. That's a hammer there, just about to knock a piece off. And then you make sure you keep it the right way up and rebuild it from this example on the on a rack and you recombine re all the pieces on the rack and then you can start making immediate measurements if you're looking for things like brittle hardness. Otherwise you send those to the lab. And the cuttings are also kept in good shape. This is one of the best examples of cutting storage I've seen where you basically every 10 meters or whatever interval you've got, you take your samples of cuttings, then you can see the trend by looking at them in the box. So you get your piece of rock, your core, you drill plugs from it, very much like that cyber core size, and you then measure properties on it. And this diagram has got porosity on it, which is the pore volume of the holes in that sandstone. You have permeability, which is the ability for that rock to flow fluid, and then the grain density, which helps you to characterize it and measure some of these properties from logs. In this example here, you've got the pore volume fraction or porosity on the x-axis and the permeability on the y-axis. And the higher the permeability, the more fluid you can get through at a particular state. The grain density here is in, in red. And you'll note from these pieces of rock here, the, the grain densities are pretty similar probably say it's a sandstone, they're all pretty much the same sort of sandstone. The quartz sand with a bit of other stuff in it might typically be in there. And there seems to be a good relationship between porosity and permeability with the blue, curve, blue squares there. So as you increase porosity, permeability is increasing. Here permeability has dropped to very low levels, as has the pore volume. The grain density has gone a bit wild, it's gone much higher, so that might suggest you've got different minerals in there. And then there's some crazy high, higher permeabilities here with very low porosity values. And the odds are that these are actually fractured pieces of rock. So the plugs that they've measured, have got cracks in them. So they're not real pore space anyway, they're, they're cracked up rock. So what measurements can we make to help us infer some of these properties using some of the logging tools we have? So the logging tools are basically equipment that you run on a wire typically, so they can send the measurements up to the surface. Usually we log them on the way out, but some measurements, particularly temperature, is much better measured before you stir up the mud too much. So temperature is best measured going into the hole. If you're on the drill string and want to measure as you're drilling, then these sensors are integrated into the drill collars and uh, the rotary steerable collars as well. And those data are transmitted to surface. And the measurements you have like gamma rays for identifying mudstones and radioactive salts. And you, from the other measurements, you deduce prosty, water saturation, hydrocarbon saturation, that's the volume of pore space with the different fluids. You might be able to derive permeability if you're lucky and mechanical properties. And you also like to understand something about the structure of the rock and the fabric of the rock, whether there are any sandstone bedding features in there, because all those influence the amount of hydrocarbon you might get out of those. And you can have image logs, logs which are based on acoustic and resistivity images, for example. And the fluid characteristics you need, so you need samples of fluids. And you look at the pressure, the composition of the fluids, the conductivity of the fluids, if there's water, for example, the viscosity and the density, and all those help us to build up the fluid type for modeling. We acquire those data in the borehole. And this is an example of the cabling structure to dangle the tool on. Depth is one of the most fundamental measurements. If you get depth wrong, you can't correlate it. So you have a, on the right hand side, you have a cable drum and that goes through a lower sheave wheel, goes up into the derrick and up a sheave wheel and then down into the borehole. That helps to have the cable going downwards as you go into the borehole. Depth is measured by these wheels on the cable and that helps us to work out how deep we are with the tool. And there's the sheaves inside a, a real derrick with drill pipe around it. Same, same principle, the sheave wheel at the top, the sheave wheel at the bottom, and the tensions can be quite high, so you really don't want to be hanging around that area when they're logging. Here's an example of one of the logging tools. This is an acoustic logic logging tool. And you'll have a sound transmitter, which in the air will just click, 
And then you have receivers here and you measure the arrival time between the receivers and work out how fast it's going. To stop the sound going down the tool, they have these slots in it so that there's a long path, which is going to be much longer than the sound travel time in the borehole. For a collar measurement, you might put different materials, metal materials in there to baffle the sound as well. And these measurements are used for calculating the pore volume again, uh, or electric properties, uh, not electric property, mechanical properties, are also used for cement evaluation. So if you have an acoustic sound in the borehole, if you've got a free piece of casing, it will vibrate and ring, and you can identify that. If it's well cemented, it won't ring. Here's another tool. This is called a bulk density logging tool. It measures electron density by bombarding the formation with uh, radiation, gamma radiation. You also have, uh, does, they're not all with a cesium source. They do have uh, electronic devices now which can cause radiation. And you look at the ratio between the near and the far sensors. And from that, you can deduce the bulk density of the rock because the extra rock that the far sensor has been through reflects the electron density. And from electron density, you can uh, determine the bulk density. You can also have imaging logs, and this is a resistivity imaging log. And these pads have just got little dots of uh, electrodes on them, and their current will flow from those electrodes. And you can build up a, an image of roughly that resolution as you pull the tool up through the hole. And these are the sorts of images from a Slumberger brochure, the two and a half foot piece of rock or four and a half piece. This is one and a half feet. You can see the fine detail here in this rock and that gives you an idea of the character of the rock and from that we can deduce the likelihood of fluid coming out of it easily or not. Fluid pressure can be measured. You can also take samples with a drill pipe. So you have a long on the left hand picture you've got what's called a drill stem test and it's just so length of drill pipe and at the bottom you've got a perforated piece of pipe and you can imagine a donut packer of rubber inflated usually by drilling mud and that isolates that section of drill pipe across so it's sandstone in this example and then you can put a low density fluid in there and hope some fluid comes up from the, the rock. Alternatively you can dangle on a similar shaped tool to those other ones a formation tester tool and you've got a big flow line usually in the middle, a pump in the middle, I'm pointing to it now, with various sensors for pressure, temperature and fluid properties. And you'll have a ceiling pack of the magenta thing against the sandstone, in this case, wall, and you'll suck and any fluid might go in there and then you'll wait for it to build up pressure and you can work out the, the pressure at a particular point. So you can work out density of fluid by moving this up in, 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 a, in the borehole to different places. And if you want to sample, you'll pump for a bit longer and then divert fluids into a sample chamber. All these measurements in the borehole are influenced by the borehole. So the logging companies provide this plethora of charts to help us correct for some of these things and you basically put your measurements into some of these charts and correct them for the borehole effects. Nowadays it's all done in computer. In fact some of the more modern tools were not calibrated in test pits in the, in the traditional way as uh, a lot of the old tools were. They're, ca they're characterized in a computer and the computer therefore uses the measurements to directly create a measurement. So if you've got a downhaul logging tool, it's difficult for people like myself to appreciate the influence of the borehole. So some of the logging while drilling charts are there just to give us a feel for the influence of the borehole on the measurement rather than for actually making any corrections. And you then put all of these data together in what we call a composite log. Um, the gamma ray log I've got at the top, and that's this black curve here, like that. You might have the bit size on there to show if you've got an enlarged hole. Some of these measurements may be a bit questionable because there's poor contact. You have a caliper log, and the difference between the caliper log and the bit size shows you where the sh hole shape's changed. You might have a resistivity log, which is on the middle track, or a sonic log on the right, which you can use to derive porosity. 
and you put whatever measurements you've got together on the composite log and it helps you to uh, work out what you've got. So at the very top of the log you've got these plus signal signatures and that's got a very low gamma ray, it's got a pretty high resistivity, these curves here are sticking out to the right and you've got a value of 67 microseconds per foot nearly for the sonic log so you deduce that that's probably a salt, sodium chloride salt. You've then got a high gamma ray here which would indicate it's probably a mudstone and the resistivity is dropped, it's quite conductive so yes you've probably got a mudstone. Next bit you've got a sandstone, it's got a very low gamma ray but the porosity log, the sonic log is quite low even though the resistivity is high so is it hydrocarbon or is it cemented with minerals? In this case it's probably cemented with minerals because if you look further down you've got some much better porosity and the resistivity is going that way so I suspect you've got cements at the top here and mudstones in these grey bands and then down here at the bottom you've got lower gamma rays mostly, low resistivity, the sonic log curve here on the right track is mirroring the resistivity curve in the middle track and therefore you might deduce that resistivity is echoing porosity suggesting that it's actually only got brine in that interval, no hydrocarbon and that's typically how we'd use a composite log, bring all the logs together and uh, work it out. So putting it all together we've got um, all the core and the log measurements, fluid pressures, temperatures, we understand the pore space, the type of hydrocarbon, we understand the flow properties of the rock, the permeability and the relative permeability of different fluids. Is water going to flow quicker than oil or quicker than gas? Some of those fluid properties to know their value to us and then the architecture from some of those dip beaters and things. We've worked out the volume from the seismic, we've got the water boundary from some of the pressure gradients, we've looked at the volume of the aquifer for from the seismic and from that we might then deduce that we can drill a hole in this particular area and exploit the hydrocarbon and we'll typically make a computer model. So we make this computer model and whoops and we try and predict what the rock will do. So we've got our ingredients, we've got a source rock, we've got an aquifer in this case, we've got a gas bearing sandstone, we've got a seal at the top, we put the model together and then we try and predict what the production will be. Here's a real production from the field I worked on years ago but what you try and do is predict what that shape might be which then allows you to go to the market people. So other uses of technology, wow, geothermal, I, I did a bit of work for one of the universities some time ago but we never got to uh, drill the well and log it so we never got that far but geothermal is a real possibility. There are some problems, so the, the low temperature geothermal that's mostly for house heating, that's not what oil and gas industry can do but the hot dry rocks might well get us somewhere. Mostly it's not very permeable so stimulation from fracking if you've got water down there if you're lucky might work but I'm not so thoughtful about that being successful. Really I think the only thing really is closed loop. If you drill two holes and connect them horizontally, two bore holes connected horizontally, you might be able, have, be able to have a closed loop system which would allow us to pick up heat from a particular interval. Certainly old hydrocarbon wells might allow us to do that more cheaply. The only snag is most of these hot dry rocks are in hard drilling areas so the temperature are often high as well and it wears things out. Now the one, the one thing that's exciting is the very high temperature stuff and volcanism is often the culprit there so in Iceland, Indonesia, New Zealand you get those things. But a few challenges with chemical corrosion and mineral precipitation, thermal problems, you cycle some of these bits of equipment through lots of temperature cycles they tend to break and just cementing and isolating them can be a challenge at high temperatures and that causes mechanical integrity problems but it's probably solvable at a price and you also need to have that energy source near to any users and then there's the economics really is it worth going that extra distance to make things work so in Krapler in, uh, in, New Zealand, in Iceland there's a fantastic example and I was there a few years ago 
and you've got this big geothermal area and they've got temperatures of 250 degrees Celsius, just a kilometer below the surface. And all around the island, you've got these hot springs, you can bathe in them and all sorts of things. So something like 45% of space heating in Iceland is from these thermal areas. And in this particular area around Krapla, you've got uh, 33 odd boreholes that produce 110 kilograms per second of steam. So they generate 60 megawatts since 1999 and 29% of that is used for <laughs> aluminium. Uh, no, 29% is used for their electricity production and 70% of that goes to aluminium production, which is uh, really quite incredible. But that whole mountainside just oozes steam. It's quite incredible that they drilled a quite a deep well, 2.1 kilometers uh, in Krapla, and they got to over 900 degrees Celsius in 2009. They had all sorts of problems drilling it. So it illustrates the problems in drilling. They, they ran a cement log, bond log, one of these acoustic logs in the casing and it was ringing. It was very badly cemented. They managed to cement it by putting cement backwards through it around the back of it, which wasn't wonderful. Um, the thermal cycling just caused the whole thing to collapse. They, they retrieved bits of it after looking for it with a camera. And because of these high temperatures, you've got all sorts of nasty chemicals, which are very corrosive and that didn't help the carbon steel to survive. So they chilled everything off and they flowed 452 degrees Celsius steam at 14 megapascals. And bearing in mind the critical point for water is just a bit above there, they were really in dodgy territory and they think they actually had uh, the supercritical fluid deep down, uh, but they didn't get much core deeper down. I've worked on a project for carbon capture, capture and storage, and I think that's one of the things where oil industry can really help get our carbon dioxide sorted out. Uh, so the logging is very similar. We've got lots of reservoirs that have now depleted of hydrocarbon that can help us work that, work that one out. Um, you need to demonstrate that you can squeeze carbon dioxide into there, particularly if it's supercritical, as it more likely will be. And just be careful of its uh, acidic properties. It's corrosive, so have the right materials. And you can inject it into non-potable waters. You don't want to spoil uh, drinkable water, but old depleted oil and gas fields are ideal. Maybe coal seams are too. Um, CO2 might be used for enhancing recovery from some of those methane beds. Although CO2 is adsorbed onto the surface, so it actually blocks things up a little bit. And make sure you don't leak any of that CO2 out. So you must make sure cemented wells are left properly in the ground. People often talk about volcanic activity being there, but human activity is 50 to 100 times more than any volcanic activity. So don't put the volcanics into uh, a misplaced place. And then just looking at the phase diagrams, you lots of boreholes that we have are in the supercritical regime for carbon dioxide. This is temperature versus pressure. And these are the phase diagrams for water and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide in green and yellow, water in sort of blue and cyan. And this area here is where lots of boreholes are and carbon dioxide is super critical in most of those. Water's somewhere else. That's very high temperature and pressure. And as soon as you get to that higher super critical regime, it might have more energy. It, it might flow pretty well, but the fluids might well be hostile. So what are the future? I think we'll probably have hydrocarbon burning vehicles around for a while, but with the rate of uptake of electric vehicles, I think people might be surprised how quickly we'll get there. We need to get the infrastructure in place and we really do need to get to battery recycling. Fossil fuels will probably remain in use for quite a while, especially natural gas maybe, particularly if we can get hydrogen involved in that and more on that in a moment. The only snag is energy density is not fantastic, so long range transport does need some sort of offsets and carbon dioxide capture. Chemical use of oils is still going to be around for a while. Cosmetics, textiles, we can try and get rid of plastics, but medicines, paints, non-stick pans, all those things come from those sources. We're probably going to need some of those for a while and 
ships are going to be going around the world. They might accommodate some of the alternatives in fuel to heavy fuel oil, but you're going to need something to accommodate those. We might go there with ships, but they're going to be less efficient. But I really think we can get underground storage working. Undesirable gas like CO2 can go there and useful gas, you need to put the swing winter use hydrogen into a place so that you can uh, get suck it out quickly in the winter. So during the summer, you can populate it. And therefore the hydrocarbon technology is pretty useful for geothermal carbon capture and storage and energy management techniques as well. So a little bit on hydrogen. Most of this is really following the University of Edinburgh's work. And they reckon that uh, that winter surge can be managed quite easily by just one old gas field somewhere. So it's not going to impact on carbon capture and storage use of those things. They've tested hydrogen with uh, loads of rocks and don't have major problems, although there could be some microbial problems. But uh, when you look at hydrogen, you mix it 20% for the current gas network, considering that coal gas had quite a bit of hydrogen in it already, it's not a proportional cut in CO2 emissions. It's only sort of 7% for 20% hydrogen then you might need to sort of fix some steel pipes, but all the yellow pipes we see in the roadworks could well function quite adequately. And just a little thought, I know I've galloped through this, but I wanted to show a broad feel for things. Um, the IPCC have just about to, well, they have just reported, and they now find it much easier to predict what's going on or predict what would have gone on if we hadn't done certain things. They're more confident with the results. They're really certain that the North American warming this summer was due to man, nothing else, because it was almost impossible with their computer runs with, uh, without the atmospheric pollution. We're gonna be seeing extremes of temperature and we need to try and manage that try and get that within reasonable bounds. And one really good thing is way back for that Montreal Protocol, way back in 1987, where the CFCs were banned, that's had a real impact. They've run some models. And this was on BBC Inside Science last month. And they've modeled how that ozone layer would have progressed had the ban on CFCs not gone forward. And it's really quite telling in that if we had not taking all those CFCs out of circulation, we would be in a really bad place. The ozone hole would have grown, UV damage to plants would have increased right up to middle latitudes, and we would be in a very bad place. So we can change things. The thing is, how quickly will it change? And we might be able to help them with hydrocarbon technology by not using hydrocarbon. I guess I'm about there. Anyway, uh, we're, we're back now. And I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for a, for a wonderful um, tour of, of what must have been a quite a long career in the industry. How, how long were you uh, working on this? More than 40 years. Right. OK, so so we had uh, 40 years and 40 minutes. I think that's the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, we, we've had some questions from the audience and uh, I've brought in uh, Richard as well, uh, Richard Packer who's um, been carefully monitoring uh, the, the traffic from, uh, from members of the audience as we've been going along. Um, uh, so if we, uh, if we sort of open it up to a chat now, is, are, you, are you ready, Richard? Yeah, we'll go for it. So we've, we've got some questions. We've got about 11 questions in the, um, in the Q&A section. I know uh, our very own Colin is, uh, is itching to, uh, to ask one, but we'll, uh, we'll wait to fit that one in a little bit later on. So um, just a, a, a quick one to start with, um, Ian. Obviously, your talk was focused on uh, boreholes in the oil and gas industry. Um, Peter has made the observation that uh, you know, those boreholes used in the water industry, and they are uh, rather different beasts. Um, probably a topic in its uh, in its own right. But uh, what are sort of the headline differences between uh, boreholes for for water and boreholes for uh, for oil and gas? Um, mostly, the water ones are shallower and often simpler, so they don't have so many casing strings. Um, if you, if you go onto the British Geological Survey's website, you can actually look at them in your area if you want to and um, get a good idea of the density of them. Some places have got lots of water wells, but water wells are pretty much the same, usually just simpler. 
A nice straightforward answer. Thank you very much. Um, so another one from Kevin Scott. So steering uh, the, 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 the boreholes, you, you touched on that. You said the steerable bit communicates a status by interrupting the return flow of the mud. Yes. But how does the control information get down to the bit in the, in the first place? In, in you, can, you can either set them up um, at the surface and some of them can downlink as well. So there's a couple of ways of downlinking to the tool. One of them allows you to pump down a cable and latch into a special connector to sort of do it very efficiently by cable. You have to stop the drilling to do that. Another one is basically the reverse of sending information up from the bit to the surface. You can cycle the pumps in a particular way. You have sort of a, a predetermined, shall we say, menu of directions to go and you can select it with certain pump signals and that will the bit will the uh, sensors in the tool down hole will say oh gosh it wants us to go right now and it will reconfigure and uh, so it can be communicated with that way Excellent. can you give us an idea of the the size of these um of these drill bits I, um, perhaps you did say that at um, fortunately <laughs> so so at the surface you typically have a 36 inch hole something like that so these are really big orders and yeah. as you go down the hole the bottom of the holes are typically six inches five and a half inches four and three quarter inches something like that so when, if it's a very very deep hole you'll go down to less than six inches in diameter they're, mo they're mostly American bits, so they're all in inches. Oh, <laughs> and, and is it common that, um, that the, the tools break and, and you have to pull the whole thing out? Is, is that how it works? Oh, yes. And that, that was some of, some of those dollar signs, euro signs and pound signs I had in there. Some of those rotary steerable systems, if you lose them in hole, the, the company has to pay an awful lost in hole charge. And uh, the, the company is sort of reduce the value of the tool progressively through time but um, it's amortized not that aggressively so if you lose one of those tools by getting it wedged in the hole you pay millions sometimes it's uh, wow. not a good thing to lose in hole you only use those tools if you really need them particularly if they've got lots of sensors built into them. you imagine you've got a, a six inch diameter collar with a hollow inside to let the mud through it You've got a motor in there, some sort of Archimedes screw or something like that, and lots of sensors in the rest of the metal. So you're measuring acoustic properties or bulk density or resistivity or something like that. And all of that gets lost in the hole. You've uh, got lots of electric circuits somewhere that you don't really want to leave them. So um, it can be quite costly. So when, when you finished, um, when you finished drilling, you presumably do have to bring the tool up and so what stops the whatever you've found from coming up with it or is that the idea that's where the mud weight comes in so the mud is always in the hole you pull the drill string out but the mud's in the hole and you remember that diagram i had at the beginning between the water and the lithostatic pressure line the mud will follow a line somewhere between the two typically and that will stop any fluids coming into the borehole ah okay right right which, which leads on actually nicely to a, a question by uh, an M King who uh, uh, who comments that you mentioned uh, if the cementing is not well done as you're passing through a, a water layer, um, you can get gas leaking into the water if you if you have got the cement right. So can you please expand on how you measure and select the optimal cement type and quantity? Quite a technical question there. All right. Um, yeah. So so there are different sorts of cements depending on temperatures for the setting and things like that. There's a whole whole manual on sort of cement selection. Um, but, but essentially you run a tool up the hole to measure the diameter of the bore hole as you originally drilled it. You then know the outer diameter of your casing, your metal pipe, and you differ, you can measure but therefore the volume of hole behind the casing and from that you can calculate how much cement to put in the hole and you you'd use the formulation of cement they use typically class g is one of their typical types doesn't matter what it means but it's a it's a sort of cement that will set in about the right time and have the right consist consistency for certain very high temperature regimes you might have to have a different 
different composition of cement. You might want to put retardant or accelerator in there, depending on the temperature regime. You don't want the cement to set too quickly. Um, there was one well where I was involved with uh, where the cement flash set, you know, you know, cement sometimes can flash set and just go completely hard very quickly. It just cemented up everything. All the cement kit at surface, all the way down the hole, everywhere was just full of cement. And you can imagine how long it took to get all that out. But um, you want the setting time to be right. <laughs> So presumably if, if you're offshore and you're, you're um, drilling, you need to take all the cement out with you to the platform. Yes, you mix, you mix, it, on, you mix it in the uh, cement pits, yes. And, and uh, th there aren't that many places in, um, in the world where you can get cement because it's the, the, the gypsum and the, uh, the silicate in it, I, I, I think, as my, my limited knowledge. So yeah. uh, pr presumably... Um, it, most of the time you find yourself a long way away from where the, the raw material uh, actually is. Yeah, sometimes the boats take a long time and sometimes you're waiting on boats. If the weather's bad, it can cause real problems. Um, you know, I've been offshore where we're waiting on something or other to come to uh, complete the programme. But yeah, you have, you have ships sailing all over the place. If you've got a big uh, building industry nearby, you're lucky. But quite often you don't. In some places, they have to actually put together a plant to even make the drilling fluid. So you just have all that created as close as you can to the beach if you're offshore uh, to uh, put it in a reasonable supply chain line. And, and I bet it's um, I, I bet it's the, just the luck that uh, the sand on the beach is the wrong sort of sand. Oh yes, it's, it's sure to be yes. <laughs> and and what you don't want to do is just rip rip uh, sand away from the beach. So I gave you an example early on of the reservoirs at Witch Farm, where you've got the you've got the sands there at um, on the coast, and they actually took sand away from that coast years ago, and it caused erosion of those cliffs. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're now putting sand back. It's really quite funny. I was down there not so long ago and uh, they've done all sorts of work to put material back on the beach. Mm. That's in West Bay. Mm. So we've got a series of questions on um, what you can do with uh, the empty boreholes. Um, you, you mentioned carbon capture and storage. Mm. Um, got some questions on could, could we put um, nuclear waste material in, in some disused oil and gas wells, for example? Um, and what's the what's what's the rough scale? Um, what, what's the sort of capacity of the sort of empty reservoirs we might have available for us? And how much carbon do we need to, to be able to put in them? You know, is there enough resource for the amount of carbon we've got to capture? There probably there's an awful lot of oil and gas fields out there in the North Sea with uh, poor space. It's got water in mostly now. But uh, or very low pressure gas in gas, some of the gas fields. But um, there's probably a good number of fields to keep us occupied for the near term, as far as I can tell, for um, carbon capture and storage. I would hope that because you've got to put pipelines in to get the carbon into those things. Imagine the pore space. I showed you that picture of a thin section of rock with the grains of rock and the pores are the gaps between the grains. So a reservoir doesn't have huge great caverns there. It's got little gaps between grains of sand or limestone or whatever. So putting nuclear waste down there would be probably not such a good idea because you'd really want to be able to keep tabs on what you've got. It's much better to have a cavern surrounded by something that's sealing like salt and put those radioactive waste in very, very well sealed containers that are going to stay sealed for a long time, no matter what, um, whether there's earthquakes. So in the North Sea, for example, there are examples of earthquakes. They go on in the North Sea. They're very low level. But you remember the world stress map that I showed very briefly there. I've looked at the orientation of stresses in a field I was working on where I was trying to work out the stress fields and there were faults that had moved just recently and the orientation of the minimum the maximum principal stress at horizontal stress changed as it went into the faults because that shear stress had been relaxed across the faults and you really don't want to put nuclear waste near something that's going to fault no no 
not any time soon. Um, the next question leads on very nicely to one I think Colin can ask himself live in a minute. So the question is, how do you drill through solid granite with mud? So the drill bit does the drilling and the mud cools the bit and it's very slow drilling. So I was involved in drilling granites many years ago and we were looking at cracked granite and the drill bits wear out quite nicely, even if you've got sort of diamond studded bits and all that kind of stuff. Um, you've got very, very slow progress through those granites. You can do it. It just takes a while. So how long would it take to go down two kilometres so that's one of those deepest ones on average? So each different rock. So you're, you're talking about anywhere in softer rocks you can get up to sort of 30 or 40 meters an hour some, something like oh, that right. easily um in harder rocks you might slow down to centimeters an hour or something like that if you're really unlucky and the bit's getting a bit warm it, it varies quite a bit but different rocks have got different rates so you the the mud long is you remember i mentioned the mud log where the the guys at the well site record as much as they can and then use that to get a better feel for where they're going through. They can look at the ROP and guess what the rock is just by looking the way it's being drilled. So that, that sort of comes on to a question um, uh, one of the audience, uh, M King, has, has uh, put forward about, um, are, are you basically doing the same thing no matter where you are, whether it's, um, uh, in, say, in the desert or... Um, in, in a, a, a granite filled island like the UK, would, are, you, are you basically applying exactly the same techniques or, or is there? Very similar worldwide. I mean, there, there are some very expensive niche products for certain bits and pieces, but essentially they're just fancy bits like the ones I've been describing. Um, there are all sorts of variations on a drill bit, but they all drill a hole basically. <laughs> So I think, Colin, you had a question about uh, about specific drill bits. I don't know if you want to unmute and ask it yourself. Yeah, certainly. Uh, <clears throat> Ian, I used to work... Or You're a little quiet, quiet Colin. Colin. No problem, thanks. Uh, Ian, I used to work for De Beers a long time ago, not not on the industrial side, but I know the, uh, uh, the output of the industrial division, quite a lot of that went into drilling devices. Typically, how often would, uh, uh, when drilling something through the kind of hard rock you're seeing, how often would you have to switch to a diamond bit? Quite, quite, a, lo quite, quite a lot of the bits we use are diamond faced. So there'd be industrial diamonds uh, just to make them more resilient and the majority of them were that way. And, and certainly in the recent years I've been drilling, you really only use the, the very simple of, you know, you've seen pictures of some of those sort of intermeshing cones, those drill bits. Those are typically ones you'd use nearer the surface in the softer rock. As you get into harder rock, you'd have PDC cutters, um, which have got the diamonds in them, and uh, you'd use those, and they're, they're very much more common. Very frequently used. <coughs> Excuse me. So I suppose we can't really leave the topic. You're... Um, you, you, you were talking about, uh, as your overarching theme, the, um, the moving away from um, hydrocarbons, which, um, uh, although it might take 100 years, you're kind of foretelling the, the end of your, your own uh, specialism, <laughs> in a way. Um, unless, of course, the, um, the possibility of reusing um, holes or drilling holes to put carbon capture, which... Uh, then, then would uh, sustain for much longer. But thinking about the sort of more general um, uh, aspects of, of uh, environmental impact, the taking the materials to the site, drilling um, the the, uh, the boreholes, and so on. Have you got a feel for how much that is? Um, it, it, contributing to the overall amount of um, uh, impact on the environment. Do you follow what I mean? Yeah, I do. Um, so all of these bits of kit usually have diesel engines <laughs> running them. Mm. So you've got lots of diesel engines. Um, there's lots of electricity generated 
So most of these could be electrified some way or another. Mm. So you could substitute diesel engines, which are often used just as generators anyway, um, to facilitate the drilling. So it would be possible to probably build new drilling rigs with more electrical properties. You're not going to stop drilling water wells and things like that. So no. it could be more invent more environmentally friendly drilling rigs, if you like. And one of the other things that they're doing to, if you like, reduce the carbon in, in, impact of activity is that outright exploration for hydrocarbon is really taking a real nosedive. Oil companies realise that they've got to change to survive as companies. So they're steering away from hydrocarbon as their only source of income. And they're looking at other ways of utilizing their skills. I've sort of hinted at some of those, but they're also utilizing the infrastructure that they have in a more effective way. So the fields that they have, they're using those as a platform to do near field exploration. So they're looking at little bumps nearby, the big bumps that they've got, to see if there are little pockets of hydrocarbon that they can then exploit very cost effectively and with minimal impact on the environment. Yeah, actually that, that, that sort of triggers another question. Is, is it better to drill fewer larger ones or more smaller ones, do you think? It depends on the character of the reservoir. I remember very briefly, I talked about imaging logs allowing us to appreciate the character of the reservoir, whether you've got particular bedding types in some of the rocks or whether they were fractured and things like that. If you've got a well-connected reservoir, you can get away with fewer holes. If it's a horrible mess, then you will need more holes. And that's the recovery factor. I, I talked about, you've got a big volume, you work out how much pore volume you've got in that big volume, and then you work out how much hydrocarbon volume you've got in that pore volume. And that gives you your volume of gas, and you then model that with the computer and get a profile of production over a period of time. And how all of those fit together influences that profile. Because if you have a gas reservoir, for example, and the pressure drops, you're not gonna be able to get that gas up to surface with a big borehole, you're going to need a smaller borehole to get the velocity to lift it to surface, or oil for that matter. And they actually do use, they call them velocity strings, so they put in a narrower pipe to recover the hydrocarbons later in field life so they can still get it up to the surface. So I, I think, I think that as much as all, all of the things you've talked about, I think that answer um, really underlines that drilling a hole is is in principle quite simple yeah but when it comes to it the answer to any question is ah well it depends and, and that's <laughs> why and that's why um the world needs an expert like yourself well yes somebody mentioned lost in hole if you lose anything in the hole you can go around it by steering around it okay right so you use one of those steerable systems to go sideways and around your hole. So I, I was involved in a well in the Southern North Sea where we had cored some of the Carboniferous rock and the core barrel got stuck. So we came back, went sideways, literally we're about five meters away. We had originally cored something like 15, 20 meters of sandstone. Five meters away, there was no sandstone whatsoever. We were right at the end of a sand channel. That taught us an awful lot. <laughs> I, for some reason, I, I, I just have in, in, in my mind that, that a, um, a steel tube like that doesn't bend, but uh, obviously it does. Oh gosh, yes, it certainly does. Mm. There are pictures of uh, blowouts in the States from the early 1900s where the whole drill string has been <laughs> blown out of the hole like a rocket. And it's just a tangled mass of pipe. <laughs> You don't want to be there. No. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, in terms of um, the the merits and demerits of, of fracking, do you, you think that really has any any credence? Um, fracking is 
a perfectly reasonable way of increasing the near wellbore permeability of the rock, you must do it where you understand the stress regime. Mm. What you don't want to do is frack upwards into another layer and cause problems. And you mustn't create earthquakes, basically. So you must also understand the nature of the rocks around that borehole. So if you've got faults nearby, if you increase the pressure in the rocks around those faults, those rocks, faults might move because the coefficient of friction on those faults will be lower and it will just slip. So what you must do before you do any fracking is understand the rock state and the, in the ground. So you need to understand the stress state, the pressure state, and what sort of rocks are down there, the mechanical properties of those rocks. So, so I guess from your, um, your, your map of the world, there's, there's not likely to be any fracking in uh, Turkey and Greece. <laughs> it's less likely to be successful, that's right. Yes. Well, I, I think we've uh, we've given you a good run there, and uh, the audience and uh, and Richard and myself um, uh, have uh, really probed uh, lots of uh, your your knowledge and experience. And it, it's been a pleasure not only to hear your um, your summary of uh, forty years of work, but also the opportunity to um, to engage in conversation has been uh, really interesting. I think so. Uh, I, I think. Uh, from from Richard and myself, that's uh, that's a really uh, really very much appreciated, and yeah, I hope the you. audience too. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think we're uh, reaching the um, the end of um, uh, th this evening's uh, event, and uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time to put together a very detailed presentation for us. Uh, we do appreciate that, and. Uh, Hopefully we can hear from you again on, on some other related thing in, uh, in the future. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for inviting me anyway. And with that, I think that's pretty much everything for today. So thank you very much for attending and uh, see you next time. <laughs>